wanted to keep it through January <clears throat> is so we could, um, a big deal that should be a big deal to everybody, it's a big deal to me running a small museum in Cache Valley, is that January 29th is the Massacre Memorial date. And so I wanted to be able to go over that and incorporate that into our programming. And so that truly is why we, we held it through till February. Um, Can I talk about everything? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so here's a few facts and figures. So we involved seven rural counties. So Bear River Heritage Area uh, formed over 20 years ago with the goal of being a federally recognized heritage area, which has still not quite got there. We are dealing with two state governments and land in rural west. So that's all I'm going to say. We're not getting political today. But um, <clears throat> so I've been involved on the board of the Bear River Heritage Area for a very long time. So it's Cash, Rich, uh, Box Elder, and then Oneida, Bear Lake, Caribou, and Franklin counties in southeastern Idaho. And um, I knew this, I mean, at a time when the Bear River Heritage Area was really grappling with identity and having people understand why it's important and why having an umbrella organization that helps um, small organizations, again, do what they do best and give them the resources and, and, and things to leverage is so important. And because the museum had hosted a Smithsonian in 2017, I had experienced that for the Hiram City Museum. And, and then it's a water theme and it's the Bear River Heritage Area. And so we were really excited as, so we took on this project and it was interesting because Courtney and I, so Courtney's the other staff at the museum, um, we were both, I was the president, she was the secretary, we're like, hey, we're going to do this with the Bear River Heritage Area, and knowing that Hiram Museum, as it's paid, actual paid people, um, we're going to do the heavy lifting on this. And um, so we did it, and it ended up, do you ever do something that you get through it and you think, if I would have known how much work that was, I would have never done it? <laughs> that was kind of this case. But again, I'm so grateful for it. Um, so yes, we had the seven rural counties. Um, we had 33 partners. That is a lot of cats to wrangle um, of busy people who are overworked and you know, no fault on anybody. Um, 20, um, we had the 13 exhibits. We were required to have a companion exhibit with these, right? Just one. We had 13. Um, and a few of them were traveling um, and so I'll talk about that in just a moment. And we had over 20 public programs, which um, included lectures, um, tours, things, anything associated with water. And we also created a comprehensive educational passport program to try to, because we're talking about a big geographical area and also the unifying branding. So people all were knowing this was part of this collection because that was one of the institutional goals was to demonstrate the importance of having a collaborative entity to the organization and also having these difficult water conversations. That's another thing that was very serendipitous about um, being delayed by COVID is now we're opening this exhibit in the worst drought year in Utah's history that anyone alive remembers. So everybody is open to talking about water in ways I don't think they would have been a year or two ago. So here's a few examples. This was one of my very favorite exhibits called Blessed by Water Worked by Hand, which is the tagline of the Bear River Heritage Area. And in the picture, both of these lovely ladies are here. Rebecca Anderson and Gail Griswold were the ones that let out on this. This was a super fun project. This is a really amazing exhibit. It's available for tour. If anyone's interested, let me know. Um, but it's a art history exhibit. So Gail created this wonderful artistic optical illusion where you put mesh over a historic photo and paint the mesh and then it becomes, it looks like a colorized photo. Very cool. People love that. Um, and then we partnered with Rebecca Anderson and had her spring public history course research. And there was a few of us that came in and taught how you write interpretive material because it's very different. The research is exactly the same historical writing, 
the writing is completely different. You have to be so precise and su such brevity. And so we created, it's nine panels total, um, one representing each of the seven counties and each on different water themes. So we have one that shows transportation. There's a road, one burning ditches, one of playing um, at Bear Lake, one of camping at Logan Canyon. So this is a really cool exhibit. And what was really great about this exhibit is we, um, this is what allowed us to get into all seven counties. Some of them were so small and rural. The only place that they had that was a public space was a library that was had very small resources. So when I call them and say, I have an exhibit, I'm going to drive to you, I'm going to set it up, I'm going to bring you collateral, you make sure it doesn't get destroyed by the preschool class. And then in four weeks, I'm going to come and take it back. And everybody was super excited about it. And so that was a very effective way to again, this my whenever the two times now that I've done a, an exhibit like this, the my philosophy, which is words that came out of Megan's mouth during a training, was to take it around the town. How are you going to take this exhibit around the town? So that's always top of mind when I'm looking at partners. How am I going to take this wonderful content and find ways to make it relevant to all the different members of my community? And also being sensitive to capacity, right, of the cultural organizations that I am roping in to help. These are some of the tours. These were really fun. So like we got to go do a water tour at Beaver Mountain and ski around all day. And so that was awesome to be able to have a have it go over January. I got to see what the other letters are. So and then the other ones were fun because they were Hiram specific. Um, one is the new wa uh, wastewater treatment plant and one is a hydroelectric plant. So we really were thinking about water in such a ubiquitous way. And then this is um, another big thing we had is just the resources provided by Utah Humanities. So you see pictures from our docent training, um, which all of our uh, partners were invited to come in. So again, this is the type of resource that this project provides. And this is, um, so now I'm bringing in my fellow presenters here. So um, Courtney Coachley, um, this is her baby. This exhibit is wonderful. She worked very closely with Darren and the tribe in this is um, not in this state, we're moving it so that when people come in our museum, this is now the first thing they're going to see is this Boa Ogai exhibit. Um, it's very important to us to make sure that um, the Shoshone had a place to tell their water story. And since their interpretive center is not done, uh, we reached out and said, we have a space, can we do this? Um, and how do you wanna do it? Um, I had another thought there. I forgot. Anyway, but it was also wonderful. So we did a program too, where Darren and Dr. Sarah Klein, who um, is at USU, is help, who's helping them actually restore the land um, to how it was pre 1963. Um, they came and talked about that effort and, and what they're doing to reclaim the land there. And so, and then people could come over and see the exhibit. So that was wonderful. I remember what I was going to say a big part of this exhibit is um, part of our, our you know, our partnership with the Northwestern Band is not only making sure people understand the scene along history, knowing not only that the pioneers were not the first people to live in the valley, but also knowing that the band has continually be present and still is present. That's very important to us. And then also, um, I think Nate mentioned uh, Dr. Smoke tirelessly roaming around the state giving lectures, including his keynote today. Um, I drove him back up to Wellsville just last month. And um, so this is him presenting in Hiram, which I believe was his first in-person one uh, following COVID. So um, it's just been a wonderful experience. It's um, collaboration is so hard and it is so much work and it is so worth it. And so at this point, I just want to turn time really over to my partners here and the rest of you to ask any questions um about how you you know how you can talk about hard things and how you can work find the people that it's not reinventing the wheel right we're finding people who are already doing these really cool things and helping them do a better job by working together okay 
Hey, uh, thanks for that, Jamie. That was great. Um, I have a question for Jamie. Um, oh yeah, there we go. So uh, the theme of, of the panel is sharing difficult water stories. So I wanna know how did the community react to, um, the, to your exhibit and how did that line up with your expectations for how they would receive it? Right. Is that on? Which one? Is it on now? No. There's a battery thing and it looks empty to me. So we'll try. Hello. Okay. So, like I said, I feel like it was very fortunate that we got the exhibit in a very big drought year because it re people really were open, I think, to having conversations they wouldn't have been had they not just been hearing it constantly and that this is a big problem and realizing how it affects everybody so much. Um, and so there was that. And I would say in my, you know, anecdotally in the people I spoke with, we didn't have much climate actual conversation. One of the panels, um, one of the Utah panels shows a picture of the Great Salt Lake and just how much Farmington Bay is dehydrated. It is not evaporated. <laughs> I'm getting older, <laughs> the words. <laughs> um, and most people were just, it just makes them sad, you know, it's like, what can we do? Um, and they're open, they realize, they, I mean, you can see that it's happening. Um, um, the probably, when I think of difficult stories, I think of the massacre, especially with the amount of youth that we have come through the museum. So gauging how old the children are when you're telling these stories, gauges, you know, how in depth you get in, in, and even the diction you use um, while you're telling the story. Um, but, I, you know, we toured so many people through the exhibit, spent a lot of time on Boa Ogai. And again, most people are just sad about it. Um, so it's not, I personally never received any kind of anger or animosity coming back at me ever about any of this people were grateful to know about it and either left with well what can i do you know and we had bo ogai cards so a lot of people left with them wanting to donate and support the project um but yeah so i don't know if that's like a knock on wood type of thing but i didn't have anybody yell at me about any of it yeah that's great um uh, can you pass the mic to darren because i want to ask you've you've been having these conversations for a while so what has what is different is there a difference now than say 10 20 30 years ago yeah thank you and so bo ogai for you all those who don't know means big river in shoshone and that's what we called it if you want to call it the bear river call it wuda ogwa wuda ogwa means bear river so let's start calling it that. I'm teasing. But not really. But not really. <laughs> I tease in truth. So what makes me really sad is we're now to the point that we have to talk about it. Isn't it funny how Western values, um, the value individual rights, the value using the land, for extraction and depletion until we can't use it anymore. And then, oh, we're in crisis now. We better start talking about this. <clears throat> that's, what, that's what's difficult for me. And that's what brings me a little sadness is we only start talking about it when we have to talk about it. And that's the difference between Western values and indigenous values. Indigenous values always value our obligations, obligations to the past, obligations to the present, obligations to the future. And when you have that worldview that everything I do matters to the community as a whole, when I hear my grandmother talk about our plant and animal and water kinfolk, well, that automatically meant to me, my relationship to the plants and animals and water 
was equal to my relationship with my aunt or my brother or sister. And when you have that view, you tend to take care of it a little differently. And so what makes me sad is over the years, I grew up in Syracuse, Utah. I'd cut out Sunday school every Sunday and go down to the Great Salt Lake, uh, down to the Antelope Island. I remember years being ticked off that there was so much water <clears throat> that it washed out the causeway. I mean, those days. And then to drive out there recently and meet a group of U of U students uh, to not see any water at all until I almost got to the island. I mean, those things are difficult. And it makes me sad that we only start talking about it when we really need to. And, and if we don't get any snow this year, if we don't get any snowpack, then everybody's going to be talking about it. I'm so grateful for Jamie and everybody else that has shined a light on this and we're getting people's attention now, but nothing gets attention like crisis and we're in crisis. And so let me just say this, <clears throat> science won't solve this. We have the science. Science can never make up for selfish behaviors. That's what we need to solve. When Jamie got up and said, I'm gonna give you a bunch of facts and figures. Well, if you heard me yesterday, people always forget facts and figures about history and science and everything else, but they never forget how they felt when they hear a story. We've got to change the heart. We've got to change our way of thinking if we're gonna solve this problem. And sad thing to say is we're all probably gonna get there, but it's when we don't have any water left. And so thank you for the question. Thanks. Um, so uh, I, I wanna ask Greg who has you know extensive uh, public history experience, um, you know, Greg, what do you think is what, what can public historians do to um, to tell these kinds of stories that need to be told um, before it gets to be a crisis? Well, I don't know if we can tell them before it gets there. Um, hopefully we can. I think Darren's absolutely right. And I take a very a somewhat cynical view of this is that the reason that we're talking about it now and it's being addressed politically in this state is because we can't ignore the issue anymore. Um, you know, and I'll talk about a couple of these things at lunch, um, but you know, we are facing a real crisis for public health and we, we can't avoid that. But as for public historians, and I'll talk about this in uh, the keynote as well, I think what we can do is provoke and that sounds very aggressive. It's not. I'll try to explain that. But I think provocation goes with interpretation. Um, it's not about insulting people. It's not about tearing down heroes or heritage. It's about making people stop and think. And that's where the difficult stories come in. And that's where everybody, you know, Megan from the very beginning was, you know, we've got to tell difficult stories. And that's always been sort of the case anyway. I think Utah Humanities in, in approaching these exhibits has always taken that view. Um, Utah is no different than anywhere else um, in terms of treasured narratives. And, and people have a particular way of viewing the past and they can um, feel attacked if those narratives are questioned, but it still is necessary to do that. Um, if we just repeat those same old stories, nothing does change. There's no expand, people's views don't expand. Um, and that's why I think um, provocation is the right word to use. And that, I'm not the one who came up with that. So I will talk about that in the, it's a very famous old book about that. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit later. <laughs> um, so for uh, for the H2O and the Bear River Heritage Area, very expensive pro uh, project. 
um, lots of partners, lots of collaboration. Um, do you want to, Jamie, do you want to speak to how developing that project, uh, did that strengthen relationships within your community? Yes, absolutely. Um, one that I can think of immediately is with the Hiram Museum. Um, <clears throat> because of this blessed by water exhibit that we toured around, um, primarily Gail back there and I spent a lot of hours driving around rural Bear River Heritage area, delivering exhibits back and forth. And then we were able to partner again on an exhibit about vaccines through the Communities for Immunity in pretty much all of those little rural libraries that we had that established relationship with took this exhibit um, because now they trusted us, right? And we had that connection. I could call them, they knew my name, I knew their name. And so sometimes it's just that simple, you know? And so it made it super easy and we you know, were able to get that exhibit around. Um, we approached school districts and a lot of the more rural school districts were not interested in a STEM exhibit that simply told the history of how vaccines are developed because it might be political. But um, the libraries, even in these rural areas, one director said to me, she goes, well, let me ask my board. She goes, but I mean, that's what libraries do, right? Is we provide information for our community. And we didn't have a problem getting into any of those libraries. So that, that was a, that was a, that's immediately one thing that I found um, that was a huge benefit. Great. Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned, you know, an example of, of what you're, kind of building on and what you're uh doing next but is, are there any other examples of uh relationships uh that you're going to build upon in the future does anything come to your mind <laughs> um i mean yeah i hope so i feel like uh, i met a lot of people and worked with a lot of people um that you know i'd only sat in meetings with perhaps um and so it also really did help better understand what other people do like people you might see at regional meetings or things like that you get into their space they get into your space um like so this um stokes nature center was one of our partners which i know about i drive up by they're right at the mouth of logan canyon i went there once 10 years ago when my kids were really little. Um, but because we had that partnership, they have this really great book that they put out about this firefly, because um, there are fireflies in Cache Valley. And um, they were looking for places to go do story times. And of course there's libraries, but also, so they reached out to me and said, hey, can we come and do one at your museum? And we have a monthly children's activity. So we did this firefly activity. And so, yeah, I think there's people you're aware of around you. Again, you see them in meetings, or if you like have access to social media at all and don't live under a rock, you probably see them posting things. And so again, like having that, you know, the name, the email, the person being in their place and really kind of having this, aha, oh, this is what you do. You know, well, I could do this in your space and reach your audience, and you could do this in my space and reach my audience. Like that, that's super valuable. Oh, yeah. First of all, thank you for being here. And um, I know that you all did. I mean, I was at Brigham City at the time. So like, I understand the trenches that y'all dug. So I mean, that wasn't an intended pun. Um, <laughs> now that I think that so <laughs> Uh, but my question, um, uh, especially for Dr. Smoke, is that is, um, I mean, we all expect, I think, expected for the agricultural community to come out and make their case. Um, and uh, I, I know, especially when we when we toured the um, HCO today at Hiram Museum, um, there was a gaggle of, of women who would um who were farmers or connected to the farmers and agricultural business in um cash valley but you toured the state 
And um, so I'd like for um, you to start to answer this question and then for um, Jamie and, and Darren to continue. So can you restate the question though? Uh, Yikes. What was your experience in um, presenting and talking to um, the agricultural folks? Well, I, you know, that's the thing is that a lot of, a lot of Utah is urban. And I think we miss, this is gonna get on to the crossroads stuff that's coming up, right? But we misunderstand what urban is. I don't know, is that, is that me doing that? Okay. Um, I mean, it comes up in some places. Um, this was in the last talk I did in Wellsville for, for Jamie. And of course, I, I talked about the amount of water that is used in ag over 80% of Utah's water goes to agriculture to this day. But agriculture makes up a very small percentage of our GDP today, very small. Um, and but that rankles some folks. And you know, I got the standard response, no farmers, no food. And I go, I agree. But the vast, you know, what most of that water goes to in this state is alfalfa, right? It goes to feed cows. Livestock is actually the biggest part of it, of something that is a very small part of the GDP. The problem, or I shouldn't say it's a problem, but you have to understand that agriculture is not just an occupation in this country. And I'll talk about this a little bit later too. It is about identity, right? Going back to this Jeffersonian yeoman ideal, it is about American democracy. Um, Willie Nelson and Neil Young and John Mellencamp wouldn't be still getting up there every year doing farm aid if it wasn't, if it was just about how to make a living. It's something much more deeper and cultural. So you have to be, I think, sensitive to that. Um, a lot of the places where I did these talks, though, are, you know, today's communities that are not as dependent upon agriculture. If you think of, of Kanab or, or, well, I guess Green River is in terms of melons. Um, but but some of the other places not so much right um and it was not as big a pushback as i might expect but you did get those types of responses to to add to that i i went to greg's lecture in wellsville whenever he comes to the cash valley i try to attend because he's wonderful but in the q a uh, somebody asked a question about what we're doing at, at the Bear River Massacre site and the restoration of the land and, and one of the water tributaries that goes into the Bear River, we're restoring, we're reintroducing beaver, we're slowing the water down, spreading it out. And so taking out the Russian olives, a half a million of them that can hold 75 gallons of water per tree. We're going to put millions of gallons back into the Bear River which will go to the Great Salt Lake. That's what I said. And an old farmer next to me chuckled and said, BS, that water will never make it to the lake because the water users downstream will use every drop of it. And then we got talking about that. That was discomforting for me. And he said, there's no way to regulate it. There's no way to meter it. And if it's there, those guys down the waterway are going to use it. And that really bothered me that our water laws are such that, you know, I have to use it or I'm gonna lose it. I live in Avon, south end of Cache Valley, most beautiful place on earth. I'm surrounded by, I have a good neighbor friend, owns a thousand acres of alfalfa. He waters the crap out of his alfalfa, even after we've had three days of rain. And I said to him, why? And he said, well, you know, I could lose it. And, and then I see him cut his hay. He doesn't own a cow. And the semis come and pick up his hay. And I said, where do you send your hay? And he said, it goes to China. And then it really bothered me that, I mean, alfalfa is the low lying fruit to me. That's the easy thing. But We've got to fix, it's complicated. I don't know how we're going to fix it without blowing up the system and redoing water law. I don't know how we meter it. I don't know how we make sure those farmers in West Weaver aren't taking more than they're supposed to take. When I moved there, they said I had two water shares. 
I said, what does that mean? One guy tried to explain, well, if you have one rainbird head on for 24 hours, that's one water share. I thought, oh my gosh. And they said, well, depends. Do you have the high line water share? Or do you have the, the porcupine water share? I said, it's the high line. Well, you don't have as much water then. You get more water from your shares if you have the other one. I don't even understand how much water I have. So I just water my lawn once every three days and just hope I'm within the rules. So unless we know what the rules are and really can enforce the rules, how are we gonna change it? Um, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. Um, just to, to switch gears a little bit, um, this is another question for Darren. But this is about uh, this is about methodology. So, in the history profession, um, I, I I confess I overheard you telling a story about somebody picking on you. I guess recently, but um, <laughs> well, so my question is, um, so in the history profession, um, oral histories and. Um, indigenous sources of knowledge other you know maybe not necessarily oral histories but these kinds of sources of knowledge have not had the same place within history um i was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and just uh say you know what do you what, what is your what is your take on on how that uh is changing or needs to change more maybe well i think it needs to change more but to assume that scientific knowledge is uh, superior to indigenous wisdom can be problematic and it can be problematic to collaboration that needs to take place. So to me, as we combine, weave together scientific knowledge with indigenous wisdom, and by indigenous wisdom, I mean, look at how the Native Americans lived in the environment before. They walked so softly that they wouldn't even leave a footprint. They took care of the environment because they knew it was a resource that took care of them, it was life. And so until we get past our selfish behaviors, as I mentioned before, all the science in the world isn't going to take it. What he was referring to is I wrote my book three years ago and a TCU professor asked if, I hope you use primary sources. And I just used all the oral history that my grandmother had told me. And I was really offended when she said that and I just quietly walked away. Uh, but I still run into that today. I am begging to get on like a task force that the state of Utah, they, they put aside $40 million to study it. I'm going, well, they got all the scientists on there. Look where that's gotten us. Maybe we ought to look at it from a different perspective. Maybe just one time put an indigenous elder, it doesn't have to be me, but so we start looking at the problem differently and maybe we market it differently. We market it to change minds. I just got back from Copenhagen and that was life-changing for me because they live sustainable. They walk and bike everywhere. They're gonna be carbon neutral by 2025 as a country and it's clean they're voted the happiest people in the world they all have health care and they all have a home and they all have a job what else do you need seriously but we've got us <laughs> water they got a lot of water too but it's clean water but we've got to start looking at the problem from a different angle all my decisions should take into account what effect that's going to have sciences are we're finally figuring out that uh, what indigenous people have been saying all the time, that all things are connected, all things. And politicians are now starting to figure out, I hope, that uh, we need to start governing for the future, for our kids in the future. The Iroquois had it right. They don't make any decisions without considering what effects that decision would have on seven generations ahead. Think about the implications of our future if our leaders govern that way, but it's got to start somewhere. 
Um, yeah, I'd like to kind of pose the same question to to Greg as well. I mean, what do you, what kind of possibilities do you imagine um, for the the history for historical research as 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 historians continue to um, you know begin to look for knowledge and data from sources that have been uh, overlooked or ignored in the past? Well, I, I, you know, I don't want to turn this into a historiography or a methods class, but oral history has always been important to me as a public historian and someone who's worked with Native peoples throughout my entire career. It brings their perspective, their voice to what is often a exclusive profession, right? That the, the way that history took shape from the mid 19th century when it professionalizes, takes a lot of voices and silences them. Right, and so archives are great, but archives are, are locations or they're sites of silence because it depends on who collected those documents and what what they deemed important, and that's what you get there. And if you only look at that, it is a very narrow slice of the past. And so, fighting back against that, I think over time, I think some historians have moved away from that. Um, it's still a deeply held um, part of our profession, though, that, that the archive matters most. And that's this person that, that talked to Darren and, and, and did not see that. Um, but, you know, I'm hopeful that, that more and more historians are thinking of oral histories. Um, they are great sources because they fill in the gaps, but they're also great sources because they they diversify the way we think about the past. Um, there's a different way of storytelling that can influence the way we write history too. Um, not the kind of stilted, kind of very formal kind of writing that might come from an archival source. Um, but I guess I'll leave it at that. I think it's, I, it's certainly something I've used a lot and again, but coming from a somewhat different perspective than many people in an academic history department. Uh, Jamie, do you have anything? Oh, we have a good uh, question. Yeah, yeah. So I come from an aerospace museum, which is totally different. I used to work with Jamie at Hiram. I left right after, right, or right before we really got into the water, the water project. But I think that it's incredible to see this kind of collaboration happening on, it's not just, between it, it's between public historians, between the Native American tribes, between local museums, but it's bringing something that you guys found was a, an issue that everybody can relate to. And I think that's something that we all want to embody in our cultural institutions. So I was hoping that maybe you guys could speak to some of the difficulties that you guys had in your collaboration and how you guys overcame that or, or what any things that were annoying or difficult or, or we've all faced sort of wanting to collaborate with other individuals what other beings other things and um had issues with you know how to make that collaboration work for everybody before jamie answers her she's going to say keep sending me texts because <laughs> she would text me and say i need this document and like a week goes by and she'd send me another text Remember, I kind of need that document. And so she's going to be nice and not say any of that, but you got to keep after it, and especially if I'm involved. So actually, the thing that came to mind is just timeline. Be generous, <laughs> because you are dealing with a lot of people and, and they have schedules and they're overworked. And we, you know, we all know the saying about good intentions, which we all have. Um, so I think the key to collaboration is um, not expecting the world to revolve on your timeline. <laughs> and, um, you know, and one thing since he brought it up that I felt was really effective because we got to where there was like two or three things we needed. And so finally, one day I was like, Darren, let's make an appointment, come to the museum. Let's sit down and chat. Can I have two hours? And so, you know, and so I was trying to be sensitive to his very busy schedule. He's a man in demand. And so I said, anytime between now, like I gave him a two week range, like what one hour can you come to the museum? And then I think I sent him an email like 
we're going to go over these 12 things <laughs> while you're here and and we did and that worked really really well you know and so just that just being really sensitive to people's schedule and 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 grace and um and also i think sometimes we're tempted to just kind of go with what you got because the deadline is here so be brave enough to just act stuff if it's not complete, if it's not done right, I am not going to put anything out there about the Northwestern until I have had eyes on it, you know, and if it just doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Um, because Darren is a man that is very busy and he didn't have time to get back to me, which is fine. It's not personal. He's got an, I, he was in Copenhagen <laughs> last week. I mean, he's, it, it's amazing you know, same thing with multiple of our other partners. So just, I think the grace, but then also just being willing to um, just ask things once in a while. If, if the partners are just not getting back to you, if it's just not working, if you feel like you're just hitting a brick wall, just let it go. Yeah. Anybody else on that? No? Um, so oh, we got to, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get you in a second, yeah. Um, Got a question back there. Um, just something that I, I kind of wanted to, to underscore. Something I think is coming out of out of this conversation uh, so far is this idea of of being professional and you know doing doing the due diligence, doing the research, but also leaving some space there for other things to come up you know i think that i think there's something really valuable to that and like you know like uh I, i'm a i'm a public history professional you know like i have qualifications and and you know we all have the qualifications and and the and the training and that doesn't mean that we know all the answers right like that there is something to be said for going into a project like this there goes the remote. There's something to be said for going into a project like this and leaving some room to to learn something or to say, hey, I, I'm not the expert on this. I don't know about this. I'm going to go and talk to somebody who is and find out something about that. So I just I just wanted to, to underscore that. And now we got a question in the back. As uh, Darren and Greg were talking about agriculture, uh, I wondered whether we're going to be able to solve this problem with uh, willing sellers or if we're going to have to go to eminent domain. It's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tom. Um, I'm going to start out my talk saying that, that historians are really bad prophets. So I, I can't really predict that, but I think that's those that's certainly a, a, a question, right? I mean, the obvious solution to water crisis on the urban Wasatch Front is one obvious solution is, is ag to municipal transfers, right? To move that water towards that population that runs into all kinds of problems, including that cultural problem. But one of the key problems, of course, is they use it or lose it mentality, the way our water law is written. Um, my hope would be that um, people would eventually, that there would be mechanisms for a willing transfer of water rights rather than eminent domain, which I think will just get ugly and will be held up in the courts for decades and maybe, um, you know, just too long. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not going to predict how that is going to work out and that's going to be one of the trickiest questions that we face the legislature has changed some things in the last year that might point in that direction but um we shall see yeah the legislature put their finger in the hole in the dam is all they've done and hopefully we get better legislation coming up to hope my neighbors will do the right thing if we change it enough to incentivize them to do the right thing, then we might have a chance. But I say blow it up, but then you're right. That's that's not going to, it'll be litigated forever. Like my neighbor said at church the other day, an old farmer with a white forehead. 
You can take my kids and take my wife, but don't take my damn water. And it was that serious. I mean, there was a fist fight in church about water. Somebody taking too much and not. We're talking about a serious thing here, and especially in the farming communities. So I don't, I don't know what that future is going to look like, but we got to change it. The other issue that we always have to keep in mind is if that transfer does take place, um, you know, Dan McCool, who taught for many, many years at the University of Utah, is, is fond of saying that we do not have a water problem in Utah, we have a water management problem, and that there's actually plenty of water for many more people. The problem, of course, is if you make it available, they will come. And dealing with growth is a serious issue, and this is exactly what Darren was getting at earlier, is that this is not a problem that can be engineered out of existence we can engineer more water we can legally make more water available but it doesn't get at that underlying problem of people wanting more and more people wanting even more i have quite a few questions questions but i guess there are comments um the first thing is, is that, you know, providing, getting the oral histories, getting the information and providing it is, is, is a great first step. But the second step is getting that information out to people that need to hear it. And how, you know, how, how do we get to that process? And also having that, that communication to developers, farmers and the collaboration, how do we get to that, that step in the management? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I've got to think for just a moment who said this. I think it was Robert Birch that said it yesterday in one of his presentations. If you don't know Robert, he's the executive director of Sima Hadithi, African American. It's a big, long name, but they're basically the black historians in Utah that are, are looking for black history. And, um, you know, he said that museums are powerful. They are a place where the members of your community can come together and 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 um, like have conversations and kind of a more neutral is not the right word, but safe yeah i like that you know um kind of like i was talking about the library we present information and museums are trusted places of information there is great data on that and so even more than professors but um <laughs> just saying but um but let me do now that i've dug that hole for myself without the work of scholars public historians would not have any legs to stand on so that it is crucial to our work um because i don't have time to to do the research that that scholars do but i use that every day in everything that i present to our community so that being said um yeah i think the space that museums provide uh, to have these conversations to bring in scholars and tradition bears and tribal elders to to come and talk and i do have to say i've had both of these men talk more than once for my organizations that i'm involved with and i'm always a little nervous i'm like please don't let anyone be mean to them <laughs> or like get in a fight with them and i we, we've done pretty well <laughs> um but i do feel like sometimes when we hear things we don't want to hear that our gut reaction is to just boom that's wrong or that person's woke or i don't like that but i think people will sit with it and they'll think about it and they'll start to value this perspective and it will change and so that that's what i see the value of my work being thank you for that um okay we are out of time um so uh thank you all for coming thank you big thank you to our panel